Okay, so we are live. Um, hello, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to La Nympha Echo, episode three, poetry and a science. And I have really awesome guests with me today. Uh, it's, um, it's the first time that we are doing poetry and a science. Uh, I'm very happy. I was really looking forward to this episode. Uh, and I have brilliant people surrounding me, uh, so I hope um, you will sort of influence me uh, in a positive way with all, all your knowledge about different things, um, multidisciplinary knowledge. Um, and uh, I first I would like to introduce Sam, uh, Sam Elimworth, because uh, he um, uh, he was uh, sort of the reason that uh, this episode uh, was uh, produced and created uh, because uh, he's part of Consilience, uh, a magazine about poetry and science. Uh, around uh, two months ago, um, I sent Sam a poem uh, about uh, a subject that is related to poetry and science. And um, uh, I was very impressed by the way some uh, work as an editor, and, and I really like the idea of the journal. Uh, I, I, I said magazine, but I mean journal. Um, and um, uh, after a couple of weeks, I think Stephen <laughs> uh, suggests uh, to to do a podcast. It was actually a Stephen idea, <laughs> to be fair. Um, so on Twitter, Stephen had this brilliant idea of um, create this episode. It, he said, he mentioned something, but and then I that uh, led to another uh, idea. And well, finally, we are all here. Um, so um, because uh, you have all, I have all your bios here, uh, but I always think that it's better when people introduce themselves because they know better than others what they are doing at the moment. So I, I, I will be, uh, it would be great if you can uh, introduce yourself. Uh, I would like to start with Sam, so Sam can introduce himself, but also uh, talk to us about the, the project, about Consilience. Hi Gabby, thanks so much. So hi, my name is Sam Illingworth. I'm an associate professor in academic practice at Edinburgh Napier University and my work and research involve developing dialogue between scientists and non-scientists and in particular giving voice to underserved and underheard audiences. And one of the ways in which I do that is through poetry, poetry being this incredible medium that enables people to talk about things in their own voice, to have their own voice heard and to hopefully enable that voice to lead to action and, and understanding. And Consilience is a collaborative journal with which I'm involved that we set up about 18 months ago. And it's the world's first science and poetry peer reviewed journal. So the idea being that poetry journals are great, but they can be a bit exclusive sometimes. And you submit work and it's either perfect and accepted or imperfect and rejected. And we know that in reality, actually, people lie on a spectrum between those two extremes. So we wanted to use the model of peer review within scientific publication so that when people submit their poetry to us on the theme of uh, on the subject of science, that we work with a team of reviewers and editors to make suggestions to the poets about how they could maybe improve or recontextualize their work. And I'm very fortunate to be part of a team that there's over 60 of us now, and we are in six of the world's continents, just Antarctic and missing. And some of the amazing poets, we featured over a hundred poets and artists now in the publication, some of them, some of whom join us today. And I think one of the great things about the journal is it helps to really demonstrate that science and poetry are not mutually exclusive entities, but are rather complementary and congruent disciplines that help us to better understand the world and the way in which we live. So that's me, Sam Illingworth, and that's the journal Consilience. And thank you very much for inviting me to speak today, Abby. Gabby. Wow. 
Well, um, that's, that was a, a great intro. intro. Um, I think uh, some, um, what was for me, uh, in, uh, I don't know, like surprising, fascinating about consilience uh, is that uh, you have this dynamic uh, that uh, if you send a, a, a poem, then you, you give feedback and you say, you can improve this, or you can change this, or, and that's awesome because it looks like something simple, but I don't know any other magazines uh, or journals that do that. But it, it looks some simple, but uh, it's, some, it's something really good. And, and as you mentioned, uh, it's more sort of aligned with how reality is of uh, writing and, and also, I know your, uh, the other day I was watching to your podcast as well. So you have a podcast as well. Yeah, so the Poetry of Science. So I, I guess yeah. um, that's like a solo project. And like, I really enjoy like writing poems about science. I'm not a particularly good poet myself, but I like, I like to offer, think about ways of platforming other voices as well. And mm. it's really lovely to hear you say that complimentary things about the editing process, Gabby. Gabby, I wonder if we could ask Miranda to introduce herself and talk about editing because not that I have any favorites in the editing households of Consilience, but Miranda often gets compliments for how thorough and inclusive and helpful she is with the editing and reviewing process. So maybe yeah. Miranda could talk a little bit about that and introduce yeah. herself. Yeah, please, Miranda, could you please, uh, yeah, talk a little bit about that? I, I didn't have the opportunity to like to work with you in particular. Uh, that's why I mentioned some, uh, but um, I would love to to hear your your perspective, your views. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll just do a brief introduction. Um, so I'm yeah. I'm Miranda Barnes. I'm I publish under Miranda Lynn Barnes, but um, I'm I'm a poet first and foremost, um, but a poet that's quite interested in science and always have been. So um, that's how I'm approaching this whole process. Um, and I, I have a background in, uh, as a creative writing uh, lecturer, um, although I currently work in a position in the, uh, the library assisting research academics. But um, I guess one of the things that uh, I was really excited about, I, I, I connected with Sam on, I think, um, LinkedIn, perhaps, about the journal and, and becoming a part of, of the process, because I think the intersection of poetry and science is really important. It's something that I, I research myself. It's something that's a big theme in my own writing. Um, but that the, the process of having um, poems come in and being peer reviewed, much like they would be in sort of the, as, as Sam has said, the, the scientific publishing process, really intrigued me because it did give that chance to further work with the poets that are sending their work in um, to, to uh, communicate what that poem is going after in, in maybe a more effective way. Um, and I, I, I think that perhaps my, my background um, giving pages and pages of feedback to, to my students um, in, in my former life, uh, really, I'd like to bring that to the process, you know, because I think you can really, you can provide input on how to make a poem better and, and how to draw out what its, uh, what its themes are, what its images are trying to communicate and how it resonates and what it evokes in a way that makes the poet excited about their own work again. And I think that that's really important to not just say, do this to make it better, but here's how you can make it even more exciting. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a great process to be a part of. And I, I'm really glad that, that Sam had this idea and, and brought it into the world and, and being part of the editorial team has been a, a great joy. So. And Miranda, what about the the issue four of the of these? Well, that, that's the the last one that I'm more aware of. But uh, why? How did you, um, you know, come up with this idea of failure? Well, I mean, uh, we uh, I think that it's a, a really a group process. So we have a, a group on Slack where all, we all work together. Um, that, that Sam manages very ably. <laughs> um, but usually we all sort of, there's, there's a, a bubbling up of ideas of what the themes might be. 
and then um, we vote sort of out of five choices. And so this one happened to be um, for issue four, the one that everybody voted for the most. But um, I think it's really interesting as a theme uh, because I think that a lot of people, at least in popular knowledge, don't realize how much failure is an essential part of science because it's, it's through failure that you learn more and you, you find out whether something's right or not and that, that it's actually a good thing in some ways. Um, and I also think with poetry, I think that it's, it's an important thing to, to engage with as well. So I, I think it's a, a really essential sort of middle ground and a meeting point, like many of these themes have been. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I, 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 it's, it's really been, it was interesting to see the different poems that came and how they addressed it from all of these different angles. So I think the creativity and the, how that engages with the science is, is one of the best things about it. And, and it's um, cu curious because um, you said like through failure is that uh, everything happens <laughs> uh, basically or, or something like that. And um, in poetry or, or writing is, is the same as well because you need to you know fail and fail and fail and, and continue working and trying to reach a sort of Perfect, perfection or, 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 you know, like a goal that never uh, arrive. <laughs> yeah, and I think that, that sometimes when you when you are attempting something with a poem and you fail at the thing you're attempting, sometimes what emerges instead is actually a success because it, it, the poem sometimes knows a bit more than you do about what it wants to say. Okay, great. Um, so uh, now I will continue with uh, the next. Uh, I'm I'm following the the uh, as, uh, in the same way that I'm looking at you is the way that I'm continuing. Uh, so now uh, the next person I have next to Miranda is uh, Angie. Angie, uh, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Oh yes. So my name is Angie Lowe. Um, I am an undergraduate student at the University of Toronto. I am studying physiology um, and also English. So I became uh, interested in poetry first. I have been interested in poetry since I was a little kid. Um, I would read it off and try to write some poems myself. I was never very good at it, but um, I would keep going and that's how I guess I got practice. Um, later in science, uh, I became interested in science later. It wasn't until high school that I became really interested in it, mostly because before I always like viewed it from a very technical perspective um, and having a very like poetic and artistic mind, I could never really like click with it very well. Um, but it wasn't until um, later when I learned to actually like approach science and see it, you know, with this like um, more like artistic mind um, and, you know, just like finding patterns and how like everything connected um, and everything flowed together. Um, it wasn't until, I saw the beauty in that, um, that I finally was able to click and connect with science. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm just very grateful for that. So yes, yeah, so now I am studying both. Um, and I was really glad to learn about consilience um, and, and, contribute it, um, and contribute to it as well, because I think it's a really amazing initiative, kind of, you know, bridging this gap and, um, Sorry, yeah, just like bridging this gap um, and making science more accessible to everyone, um, but also making poetry more um, accessible to everyone as well. Um, you know, just as, what is it? Yeah, so just as, you know, science can be accessible to poets, now poetry can be, um, you know, more accessible to scientists. And I just think it's a really awesome thing. Yeah, yeah, that's a an, an, you know a good point because uh, both uh, poetry and uh, science they have that side that uh, some sort sometimes they are not that accessible <laughs> to other people. Um, so it's interesting to that that connection. Um, and and what is interesting as well is that you can uh, when you mix poetry and a science you can be 
either a poet or, or you can come from a, 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 the science uh, discipline or you can that you can be both that like you can be a poet uh, interested in a science or you can be uh, and some someone like I don't know um, Sam or other people here that, that that go the other way around like from a science to poetry and I think that's that's interesting as well. Um, Okay, so I, I will continue with Ruth. Um, Ruth, uh, would you like to, to introduce yourself? Hi, yes, I'm at uh, Eric Watt University in the Scottish city of Edinburgh. Quite sunny at the moment, unusually. Um, I'm a professor of computer science. So I've been doing computer science since the late 70s. I originally went to work for a computer company, then I eventually worked my way into academia. Um, so I see what I do, um, I work on robotics and artificial intelligence myself, but I see all of these disciplines as ways of structuring the world or changing the world. And poetry's enterprise is rather similar. It's another way of structuring the world. And if you're very lucky, changing the world, though Auden said poetry changes nothing, but occasionally poems do strike home and then they do change the world. Um, so I don't see these as mutually incompatible activities. I see them as partner activities, if you like. Um, I've written poetry as well since I was a child, but I never expected I would earn my living by doing this kind of thing. And most poets don't, of course. They earn their living by doing other things than poetry. Um, they teach, they run seminars, they edit, they do lots of things. It's hard to make a living out of poetry. And I have four children, so I definitely needed some way of making a living. Um, but yeah, AI and robotics is a fun way of making a living. But I've carried on writing poetry. And of course, in poetry, your whole life goes into your poems. So of course, some of what I write about is, uh, is mathematics, computer science, some physics, because these are part of my life. So they, they end up being part of my poetry. Although I must say the pamphlet I just brought out was about the lives of women, which is another part of my life. So yeah, I, I see these as, as synthetic activities, not activities at odds with each other in any way. Yeah, so uh, you brought a new, you know, like new themes. <laughs> So, um, how to make a living uh, about with poetry? If you need more activities, <laughs> uh, being a, a woman uh, in poetry or an a science. Um, I, I I was reading uh, some comments that the audience are uh, you know leaving on our uh, social media account. So we have this is awesome from Enrique. Uh, we have Laura saying, I never heard about uh, poets who are also a scientist. The, uh, Gisela is saying, this is very interesting. Laura is saying, very interesting. So thanks to the audience uh, that are leaving uh, messages on uh, La Ninfa Echo UK. You can, uh, if you are watching this, uh, leave us comments. I, I will be reading some of the audience's comments. Um, Okay, I, I, thanks, uh, Ruth. I, I will continue with Stephen. Stephen, please, would you like to introduce yourself now? Yeah, hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Stephen. I, I guess I'm a practicing chemist. Uh, I teach chemistry. I do research. I have a you know, research group that's very active. I've reached my position at Kingston University via Oxford, Cambridge, industry. Um, and what really excites me um, ab about this subject, I mean, I, I write poetry as well, is the more I've learned to delve into science, the, the, the more beauty that you see in the world. And, and rather than just describing what we see in terms of you know, scientific fact, which you know can be a little dry at times. Um, I've tried to describe the natural world, if you like, using poetry as well. And you, you can see a very different perspective. Um, and I think putting the two together is like two halves of a brain almost. Um, they, 
you can view them separately, but if you put them together, you get something much, much richer. And maybe you see the full picture. Um, so yeah, I'm always looking for, um, you know, ways to use language in innovative ways um, yeah. to convey scientific um, discoveries, but I also write other types of poetry as well. And um, you were like the starting point of this episode. <laughs> so it was uh, your, <laughs> how do you feel about that? Well, um, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, it's just nice to be involved. It's <laughs> so you promote it, it, all the activities yeah. of resilience, particularly, I think. Um, yeah. No, when you mentioned uh, uh, about podcast and all that, I said, what a what a great idea to to you know put all of us together because uh, otherwise it would have been um, an issue for and people would have read it. But this is nice to connect as well in in a more in another way. Um, so okay, so th thanks uh, very much, and uh, I will continue with Clint. That is the, the next one, and and this, and then the last one is uh, Steve. <laughs> Hi there. Yeah, yeah Hi. I'm, I'm Clint Wastling, and uh, I'm a full-time writer now. Uh, I've got to that uh, state of nirvana uh, where full-time writing, of course, means 99% wasting time and 1% trying to actually write down all your ideas in in the hour you've got left. Um, so yeah, I, I love. I, I, I trained as a a geologist to start off with and worked in the oil industry uh, and eventually ended up uh, lecturing in chemistry at uh, college. Um, so I was very lucky in that uh, I grew up in Scarborough. So uh, the area around Scarborough is one of the richest in uh, terms of rocks and fossils. And, and, and it's credited with the being the place where uh, uh, geology actually was uh, really sort of came to the fore at Saltwick Bay with the discover of, discovery of things like the fossil alligator, um, Teleosaurus chapmani, as it was called, and I think it's now called a plesiosaur. Um, so there are all sorts of fantastic sort of history, fantastic uh, uh, geology, and uh, really great walking country. So that's my background, and putting those things together is where a lot of my poetry comes from, um, including the one in Consilience, the issue four, which is uh, really about uh, coastal erosion along the East Riding there. So putting those things together, I, that, that, that comes up with the uh, layers, which is my poetry collection, which starts to put those ideas together. Um, so you know, it could be anything that uh, starts a poem off, finding a fossil on the beach, um, finding something out about uh, a particular environment. There's a hill near where I live called Ella Hill, and uh, that basically derives through almost 3,000 years of naming hills uh, as being a place where uh, a Celtic uh, lady chieftain or charioteer was buried. Um, and we, and we have a, a lot of chariot burials in the area and they are usually uh, very important women from Celtic society. So, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to, to add other dimensions to my work, uh, you know, the landscape and the geology. Yeah. Abby, could I interject and ask Clint if he wouldn't mind reading his poem, East of Zero, because it's a really beautiful piece. Clint, would you mind? Is, is, are you happy to do yeah. so? Yeah, yeah I've got it here. Yeah, yeah it's... Um, Okay, so this is um, the poem I, I was just mentioning about the uh, coastal erosion uh, along the East Riding coast in particular, where it's all boulder clay, it's very soft material. Um, and also about how protecting one piece of coast uh, increases the erosion elsewhere. So I called it East of Zero. East gets less each year. The curse of stupidity, like Canut, forbidding high tide. We protect vital assets and lead softer land south to its fate in the grey North Sea. East Riding, it marks final landfall before the Greenwich Meridian touches the North Pole. 
Longshore drift erodes Easington, Kilnsea, ground to sediment deposited at Spurn. Earth is scooped away by the Holderness Ord, a worm of water uncoiling, twisting, making land see again. Zero is imagined, a construct for longitude. In 100 years, nothing will lie east of here, and our house, 12 miles from the coast, will become literal. Oh. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Um, um, thank you very much for sharing your poem. Um, and then we will share more poems. So this is just the beginning. <laughs> Right. <laughs> uh, and um, I will now continue with Steve, poor Steve, that, uh, he was left to the end, but um, I'm really looking forward to hear your, uh, you know, about your career and, and your thoughts about poetry and science. Steve's smart and uh, I live uh, just outside Dundee in Scotland. Um, I've uh, recently kind of rebadged uh, Steve Smart. Uh, Steve Smart's badge now says um, uh, poet and visual artist, uh, but for sort of 20 odd years before that it was an information designer for the University of St Andrews, where a lot of my work was involved in uh, communicating research to the public, uh, designing exhibitions and exhibits to do with that. But um, going back further than that, kind of the art and science themes have played uh, kind of alternatively syncopation maybe I don't know um, throughout my life I started out in physics and electronics and um, uh, one way or another ended up at an art college after that and uh, eventually um, became a designer um, so I've been particularly interested in poetry for about the past 10 years I've noticed going through my work that um, science is often a source of inspiration um, I think there's an awful lot that, that, that people research um, and, and find out new knowledge about, which to me seems enormously lyrical, seems fantastic. You read about things, you think, wow, that's amazing, or that's beautiful, or that's frightening. Um, and um, there, there, there are real places where poetry, which is a medium that's often uh, about emotion, um, can, I think, engage usefully with these themes and, and reveal some of the, 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 kind of the, the human feelings that, 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 they, that they can provoke. Um, science is about object, objectivity and knowledge, but it's done by human beings, and human beings are emotional creatures uh, who have um, uh, difficulties, frustrations, fears, uh, and, and joys about their work as well. And I think these are all quite interesting to think about. As a designer, actually, I also quite like quite a lot of the visual things that come up in science. And uh, later on, I, I, I'm going to be reading later. Is, is actually partly my reaction to um, the diagram. <laughs> so that's a little different. So I, I, I'm quite uh, quite happy because uh, all of you, uh, you mentioned different things uh, that uh, could, could be subcategories, and and all of them are very um, fascinating to me. Um, so yeah, so this is about um, what you mentioned about emotion and science. That's also something I never thought about that, <laughs> to be honest, that uh, because I don't have a, a background in a science, but it's true that we are like, I, I, I know, I, I thought about it in the, in a, um, when, when I'm thinking about academic and the academic work that it involved uh, the emotional side as well. Um, but never related to the science and, and I think it's fascinating as well because emotions could also be part of something that you are developing. Um, okay, so um, thanks uh, for your introduction. Um, I, I would like to, to start a sort of open discussion that you, you all talk a little bit about different things, but I would like to ask you in general, uh, why it's important uh, to mix poetry and a science? So, and just to a uh, sort of open discussion and you can share your ideas, views. Please, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to go off. I think, I think a lot of us have, I, I guess, look at things in a similar way, even if, and, and lots of people have talked about, I guess, 
the need for science and poetry to work together to offer complementary ways of, you know, making sense of the world. I think f for me, um, sometimes it can be a bit, science and poetry can be a bit exclusionary at times and they can say, we are, we use a certain language and we're for a certain people and you're welcome or you're not welcome. And actually both science and poetry at their best can be really inclusive and really diverse and really inspirational. And I think that sometimes science can take itself a little too seriously. And poetry is really good at helping to question that and interrogate that. And um, poetry can really take well. itself a little too seriously as well. Oh, exactly, exactly. <laughs> And so, yeah, I think I think they're just they're just nice ways of of, of being, in my opinion, being complementary with one another. Absolutely. Well, I think we translate in poetry um, the language of science into something which can be understood by people who are not into the language of science. A lot of science is expressed in mathematics of various types, and mathematics is an extraordinarily expressive language but you have to learn it and you have to understand it in order to know what it's saying. And because of the way our society is, only a small minority of people can actually express themselves in mathematics or understand the expression of scientific ideas in mathematics. At least poetry, though it can itself be a bit exclusive, is using natural language. And we all know natural language. And so your chances of communicating rise somewhat and even more so if you can use vivid images which bypass people's suspicion or caution about these things or the feeling it's not for them or it's too dry or you have to be super intelligent to understand it or lots of other things. And with a vivid image, you can break through that shell and make people feel that they understand what's going on in a sense that doesn't require you to understand mathematics. So I, I think that's a very valuable thing that poetry can do, but it works the other way as well. Science has its own applicability as metaphor. So I find sometimes that you can write a poem where the way to say it is to use some ideas from science. So it's not about science, it's using ideas from science to express something else. So I once wrote about love as quantum mechanics, for instance. Um, there's a similar degree of uncertainty attached to both, I felt, which is where that came from. So I think they're in dialogue. Uh, science can be manifested through poetry, but it can also be a, a fertile field of metaphor, um, a domain from which poets can draw. And it's a resource that not every, every poet has because they haven't done science. So if you have done science and you're a poet, you've got an extra resource that other people haven't got, which I think is really nice. Yeah, and, and it's also uh, what you are saying is also fascinating because in poetry as well, there are problems with accessibility. And sometimes some poets write in a way that is very difficult to get. Um, and that's also a discussion in, in when you are studying creative writing, you know, um, like um, people from my background, um, uh, like very strong in creative writing you know, or literature, they know. Um, a lot of people, when, when you mention to someone um, that you are a poet, people say, oh, no, <laughs> poetry, that's, that's horrible. I cannot understand it. Shakespeare, uh, or, or they mention some writers, it's like poetry or literature is frozen in some styles. Um, but you can make it more accessible as well. Uh, so it, sometimes it depends on the you know, on the accessibility of the writer as well. I guess in a science, there are ways to be more accessible. I don't know. <laughs> there are um, as well, like, there are some theories that says that um, some poets write in a very close way because um, it's a way to keep people far from it. <laughs> so there is a sort of economic conspiracy surrounding that. Um, but I, I, I would like to interrupt here for one second because someone from the audience uh, left us a, a question. So uh, she's saying, Bethany, she's saying, I'm really, I really enjoyed the poem. So that's for Clint. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and then uh, she, she asked, is a, a consilience a place where a scientist could try and find a poet to creatively engage with their research and or a poet could find a scientist that could share more of their research on a topic that the poet is interested in. Oh, Sam's got to talk about that. Well, I, I hope so. So we have a, we have a, an inclusive Facebook group that's, that's growing and we try to share ideas and um, ideologies. And Ruth is involved in a project that does just this actually. So Ruth is a sickeningly talented person in many, many aspects of her life. But um, Ruth's involved in a project that I run with my colleague, Dan Simpson, called Experimental Words, where we paired together 10 scientists and 10 poets to create interdisciplinary explorations of their work. So watch out for that, because that's coming as a spoken word album that, that Ruth is involved with. And we really welcome, like me personally, but Consilience and, and hopefully humankind welcomes the opportunity for scientists and poets to collaborate on this. Uh, my, I, I just wanna say one thing on this. I love it when people from different disciplines work together, but I think it's really important that that collaboration happens at the beginning and that it's not just a, you're an artist or a poet and I'm the scientist. So I'm the clever person who's had the research idea and you're the creative person. You need to make something about my work. Actually, I think when the amazing collaborations happen is when we bring in the artists and the poets and the scientists at the very beginning, and we say, you're an artist and a poet, you've got your own research methodologies, epistemologies, ontologies that are amazing and will help me to recontextualize my own research. And I'm a scientist and actually I'm creative as well. So I think, yeah, a long answer, but I hope that we have created this space. And really, we do encounter quite a lot in terms of scientific publication is that often aren't that many venues where scientists can be expressively creative. That's something that's often absent. I mean, scientific publications don't provide venues for creativity. Absolutely. Not what they're about. One thing that, oh, sorry, sorry, I started to talk. I was just going to briefly say one of the things that had um, sort of came about as a result of, of um, the science and poetry um, a conference that happens yearly, as well as the involvement with consilience, is that uh, Stephen and I have uh, actually working on a collaboration together where uh, we're creating new poetic forms based on chemistry. So I think that some of these things sort of just happen organically, if you will. <laughs> Um, and um, where we're quite excited about what's coming out from that. So I think it's, I think it seems like it, it, it's something where there's a, a hunger for that, that collaboration and, and that working together. So it's, it's quite interesting to see what comes from it. I'd like to see more universities doing residencies actually. Um, Harriet Watts um, Geosciences just did this very innovative project. Um, they got a poet along to work with geoscientists and she spent the whole week in the university and in fact although she was only mandated to produce three poems she produced the whole book called Tilted Ground um, and that has had a, a really good effect I think on bringing scientific ideas and poetry together good for her good for the people that she worked with as well a lot of universities could do this it's not vastly expensive because people who are poets are you know they're very poor mostly which means that even a few thousand pounds goes a long way in poetry terms if you want to recruit a poet to actually do some work for you. It's not like uh, buying a cyclotron or you know, a huge lump of equipment in physics. A poet comes cheaper than most, most physical equipment does. So I'd like to see universities doing more of that. I'd, I'd like to see Ruth also universities and literary establishments have scientists in residence because I think that that would be really interesting, be mm -hmm. it uh, English departments, be it the Poetry Society, whatever. And the project that Ruth's talked about that's run by Pat Corbett is amazing. Like it's really, really like hats off to them because it's it's a really cool project that they've been working on. But yeah, absolutely Ruth, we should have poet, we should have poets in residence and scientists in residence in every institute in the UK, basically. Yeah, we, we have, um, so the, the Bethany said, uh, really good to hear, sounds like lots of exciting collaborations are happening, would love to be involved. 
It's, okay. It's really interesting because I'm finding as part of my activities that um, students often struggle with getting to grips with organic chemistry mechanisms and biochemistry. And, and, and we're using poems to actually help the students learn um, that if you like bypasses the heavy duty pushing curly arrows around and things like that. And, and so actually poetry does have a, a way of assisting scientific learning, we're finding, um, which is very interesting. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that um, other disciplines, they have their impact as well and, and in the, you know, in the development of uh, different projects. So, um, and also the other way around, like if you, if you're a poet and you start writing about, uh, so for instance, when I came up with um, Consilience, uh, Maraya uh, William, uh, she's a poet, uh, who is part of our team at Learning FICO UK. Um, she shared something about consilience and I started to read about the project and that uh, made me write in another way as well. So it influenced me to, to change my, my way of, of writing as well. So, so I think it's very, very interesting what happens there. Uh, how, how can we, uh, create more spaces like uh, consilience. Uh, what, what can we do to improve um, this, to, to create more spaces, multidisciplinary spaces? Uh, what do you think? Or, or if you have other projects that you would like being, to share being, as well. Being provocative for a second, I, I think these spaces that like, you know, they, they can be created, but it, it it requires a lot of volunteering as well. And a lot of like people giving their own individual time and resources and effort. And I think one of the, one of the things we want to try and do with Consilience more is to be able to get funding so that we can, first of all, pay our reviewers and our editors for the amazing work that they do. And then also look at paying the poets for their submission because we want to make it free for people to access, but I think that it's really important that people who don't necessarily have full-time positions are rewarded financially for, for the hard work that they're doing. And I think that sometimes having those collaborations can be really difficult because a lot of, not all, but a lot of scientists are maybe in full-time, reasonably well-paid positions, whereas a lot of creatives don't necessarily always have the um, long-term security that, that, that their compatriots might have. So I think creating these spaces and like Gabby, the work that you do with La Nifa is amazing. But I know that a lot of the work that you and your your colleagues do as well is is, is voluntary and it, it is a passion project, which is really important. But also, you know, it's we need to find ways to fund that as well, so that those people are rewarded, rightfully so, for the for the amazing work that they do beyond just just in inverted commas it, it, exposure. So yeah. it's a labor of love, but I guess working out ways to make it not profitable, but that, that rightly rewards people for their work is, is a challenge that I'd love to hear some thoughts yeah, on. Yeah. Yes, uh, it's a really big uh, challenge and it's a hot uh, subject. <laughs> and I think, um, yeah, so in the, in the literary um, uh, world, uh, I would say, um, I think the problem is that there is a sort of dominant uh, sort of institutions that they have all the resources and then the 95% of the other writers or, or teachers or academics that have projects, they don't have funding and it's very hard because most people don't have funding to, uh, to support uh, these projects. And they are important because there are different voices, different per perspectives than the dominant one. And I think it's, it's, it would be awesome if, if the government <laughs> uh, or, or if other institutions can, uh, you know, uh, be more uh, fair <laughs> in a way uh, and to support different organizations. And, and I don't know, uh, I, I know so many writers that they, they work on voluntary basis. I know more writers that work on voluntary basis than 
uh, writers who are actually the other day a poet uh, was telling me something and she said I'm very happy because I wrote a poem and and I got paid I, I get paid and and it was like <laughs> wow <laughs> you're getting paid because uh, it's, it's so unusual uh, that is we actually we celebrate that but it shouldn't be like that because it's a it's a job like others, um, but there are so so many stereotypes uh, that are damaging um, about it, and and I don't know. There are a lot of work to do, but uh, oh, thankfully <laughs> we are working on that. Uh, I, I have another uh, another person uh, from the audience. Uh, Henry is asking. Uh, so I, I will try to. Um, sum up uh, one thing uh, that was mentioned in the podcast that is important for me is that is key that poetry and science make sense of the world and in our present world where the irrational is taking over in the last decades notoriously and during these pandemic times was more ev evident than ever poetry and science can work together to make sense of the world of a dangerous more irrational world it's very evident that the rationality that poetry brings to the world, the formality that requires to put together skills like translation, writing, reading, interpretation, and more, reflects up to a certain point the scientific method. I really love this program. <laughs> okay, so the, the, um, we have passionate uh, followers. <laughs> um, so it, it's, does anyone would like to add something to this uh, comment? I think, I, I, I think it's... Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Clint. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I think it's down to us poets to sort of get out there and really advertise, you know, the links between poetry and science by actually showing people how it could be done. Uh, not trying to sort of say that it's, you know, the best practice in poetry, but this is what we're trying to achieve. This is the overlap between, you know, trying to get this scientific idea across and poetry, uh, have a go at it yourselves and uh, see if you can do better. I think that's, you know, we've really got to encourage people to, to, to write more about poetry and science. And I think a lot of people are really interested, particularly when it comes to things like the environment and, uh, you know, all the, the global warming and, uh, uh, you know, uh, acid rain, all these sorts of things that uh, people know a lot about from uh, the media and possibly from uh, school and college. So I think, you know, we've got a real duty to, uh, to try and get the message of these important uh, scientific uh, ideas out there. I think you can overestimate the link between scientific method and poetry. Um, science has to be judged by reality in the end, and poetry doesn't have to be judged by reality in quite the same way. One of the benefits of having people from science writing poetry is you're not going to get bad science in the poetry. So people who write poetry about the climate um, are attacked, not attacked, um, criticised, I think, by people active in the field of um, you know, climate issues for sometimes writing poems about the weather rather than about climate. And one of the fundamentals of climate science is climate and weather are not the same thing. Yeah? But somebody who comes from a non-scientific background may choose to write about climate as they think by writing about a weather event, which is not the same thing. So, it's not really true that poetry is the scientific method. I would dispute that with your questionnaire, your, your subscriber. Um, poetry does somewhat different things. It does make sense of the world, but it could also make sense in the way a conspiracy theory can make sense. So poetry doesn't have to be at the service of truth. Well, one of the things poetry can be about is poetry can be about human experience. And, and poetry is, if anything, predominantly about uh, human experience. Um, and um, not all science is about pure research. A lot of science is applied to science. Applied science. I, I'm kind of thinking my way towards a, a project that I was involved with a couple of years ago uh, called Pain for Doctors, which is a collaboration between the Scottish Poetry Library and uh, the University of San Francisco of Medicine. Um, 
this wasn't a writing project. It was a project that came off the back of a book that the SPL produced, a collection of poetry, which was then given to all graduating doctors in Scotland as a gift. Um, they've now followed that up. They've actually recently produced a book which is for uh, nurses and midwives, collection of poetry. And these are poems about some of the most profound and difficult things that we encounter as human beings, um, because that's the stuff of your job if you're a medic. Um, not every day, not every moment every day, but often. Um, so partly the reason for the collection was to provide somewhere you can step outside of your busy life when you have a moment and you choose to and reflect. And that's something poetry is very useful at, very good at, is reflecting and providing spaces and venues in which we reflect. Every time we read a poem, we are reflecting and think of somebody else's encounter with life. Um, actually, one of the things, kind of down this bed a little bit, but slightly off at the side, that interests me, um, as well as at the School of Medicine, I was involved in working with the School of Biology. Um, and something that's always interested me a lot, is, uh, I find kind of a, a puzzle, I think interests quite a lot of people, is not what goes on in other people's heads, God knows that's hard enough, but uh, what, what's going on in animals' heads? How do animals think and how, how are they, how are their behaviours put together? And, and um, um, I found that has been quite an interesting topic for a number of points. It's speculative. We, we don't know that, but there are many researchers who are involved in trying to understand that much better than we do. And I also found that quite an interesting uh, approach. And of course, it, it eventually comes back to us. We, we learn more about how we think because we've spent more time thinking about other creatures. Yeah, I mean, Oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say, I think that um, Angie wrote a poem for the last issue about um, on failure, on, about Mendel's prayer. And it's a, it's a beautiful poem. It's quite long, Angie, so maybe not all of it. But Angie, like, I think this touches on this a little bit, in, as in when I read the poem, and sorry if I've misinterpreted it, but it was a way it was almost granting a permission through poetry to understand the work that science wouldn't allow to some extent. I, I was wondering if, would you be able to read like a couple of the verses from that piece, Angie, and explain your rationale behind it? Because it's a really, really amazing piece. Oh, yes, I would be very happy to do that. Um, so yes, the poem that I wrote for issue four of Consilience was called um, Mendel's Prayer. Um, well, it was kind of a tribute to Gregor Mendel. He is my favorite scientist. Um, and so basically um, the context of this poem um, is, well, it was based off of um, a real event um, in Mendel's life where after um, his doing his scientific studies um, at the university, um, Mendel was condemned by um, the head bishop of the city who had gone to pay a visit to the monastery, um, stating that his studies in science were profane, um, that they were denouncing of God, um, and yeah, and that they dishonored and were against God. And um, at this point in the poem, um, Mendel is doing his experiments and kind of looking back on that condemnation and feeling rather discouraged and conflicted um, between his devotion um, to his God um, and also his love and appreciation for um, scientific learning. Um, and then, yeah, Mendel um, is also reminded of failures of his past life. Um, he did have um, experienced quite a few failures um, throughout his scientific career. Um, for instance, he failed his exams um, when he, as he studied at university. So as he's um, contemplating, you know, these previous failures, he becomes discouraged and, um, you know, contemplates seizing his experiments. But then over the course um, of this prayer um, that this poem is in the form of, he begins to realize that science is a way of, science can be used um, as a way to honor God um, rather than to, um, yeah, honor God and glorify God rather um, than to diminish him. Um, and then he regains a renewed assurance in himself and his work. Um, and throughout this poem, he's just like weaving um, science 
together with his faith um, and just weaving these insights together. Um, so yes, this poem is rather long. So I will just read an excerpt. My God, who loves the flowers of the field, who clothes them in deep purple and in white, is it such sin to know the way you made the beauty of their habits, which they share with all their children? I remember when I traced the very nature of their hue, the very path it took as it was drawn from old to young. And that relief I felt to realize that though I only saw one predecessor's mark, the other one had not been lost but still was carried down and lay within. That comfort to have known that none were meant to have been left behind. I once recall a service where I sat still as a child, where I first heard the verse, and there I heard the preacher talk at length of birds and, not, and how not one was left or lay outside their father's care. Oh, Augustine, who said that all things do but point to God. Do all these notes and tables then but place a light towards the love they call divine, where all small things are e'er attended to, and by your will, none should be left behind? If such things should be worthy, Lord, then I shall keep these notes as science and as praise. And if the message may not come to light within this time, then may you keep it as a flower's hue. For if it is not seen by those who pass among this generation, then may it lie there covered, but not cast, and there remain. For there may be a time where it is met as flower colors marks meet when alike when carried down its path with some like mind, and it resurfaces full and resplendent, blooming to the sun. Yes, um, so that is um, an excerpt from my poem, Mendel's Prayer. Um, and also just for a bit of extra context for those that might need it, um, Mendel was known as the father of genetics um, as he discovered the basic principles of inheritance um, through doing experiments on pea plants um, and how traits of pea plants such as flower color um, were inherited throughout generations. Um, and as well as being a scientist, he was also an abbot um, uh, and an, Aug an Augustinian monk um, who later became an abbot. So he was also very devoted to um, his faith. And okay. like I said, this poem is when he, where he kind of weaves um, both of them together. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks, thank you very much for sharing. I have a comment for you actually. Uh, someone is saying, Love your poem, Amchi. Thank you for sharing. Um, there are so a bit more of comments that I will read, but then after this, uh, I would love to continue with uh, some. Uh, I will ask you to share your poems uh, because I'm aware of time, uh, so I don't want to, you know. Um, lose uh, time <laughs> reading or what well, uh, it's important that you read your own poems um, so um, someone is saying poetry is beauty and as such is subjective Gisela so uh, greetings to Gisela then uh, we have um, hello Gabby hi Giovanni <laughs> Then we have um, Henry, in the Latin American poetry tradition, the Nobel Prize of Literature, Octavio Paz, make a science part of his literature. Thanks, uh, Henry. Um, then we have people sending hearts. <laughs> and okay, so thank you very much for the lovely audience. We have many, many comments. Uh, I would like to continue with Ruth. Uh, so I uh, would love to ask Ruth uh, to read or share a poem. Okay, I'll read one that was in Consilience 3, in fact. One Great. of the things you can do is to write about scientists and to try and make their lives more tangible for people who don't know them. So this is called Radioactive Skodowska, and you'll work out who it is by the end, I'm sure. My cookery book, still too hot to hold. My papers in a lead box. 
I gave you the word for the real but unseen penetrating the body, irradiating mine from the test tubes in my pocket, the glow in my desk drawer, from floating university to the Parthenon, quite a journey, you might say, never mere to myself, but for them, that woman, irreligious, too clever by half, and much too Polish, until dead with poisoned blood, when they made me an icon. But give me my full name, Maria Skodowska Curie. Many thanks. Um, uh, would you like to read another one? Because it was a bit short. Um, so if you would like to add another one. Well, I think if you pass on to someone else. Um, um, you can look for. I can look for uh, one. Yes. OK, um, Stefan. Yeah, sure. Um, I just want to pick up on a point from before about um, yeah. what we can do as a community, perhaps. I think we could all try and convey the fact that by collaborating, scientists and poets can actually discover something surprisingly new and almost like a third arm, you know, something of more value. And you can go on a journey that you don't expect from the beginning and end up with something more powerful. Certainly what we're seeing in the collaboration with Miranda and myself um, is, is actually quite striking, you know, the results that you get when you're really collaborating in this way. And maybe just getting that message out there will be useful. Um, thank you for the opportunity to read a poem from Consilience 4. Um, and again, I want to thank, I think, Miranda, the editor here, and Sam for helping to evolve this, this idea in my poem. Um, a lot of my time spent on um, um, biology and chemistry and the intersection and the discovery of new medicines, therapeutics. And this poem touches on bacterial cell walls and the action of penicillin to destroy bacteria. Um, just to set the context, there is um, a very mesh-like structure, um, very complicated in the cell wall of a bacterium. And when um, the drug comes along, penicillin, it binds to an enzyme and disrupts that cell wall structure. The integrity, if you like, of, this, of the bacterium disappears and it doesn't survive any longer. So I took the sort of um, view on all of this from the bacterial cell wall and tried to, you know, describe how it might feel, if you like. So again, bringing in the, perhaps the more emotional aspects of science. So it's called a bacterial cells wall view of penicillin. I shroud the cytoplasmic membranes are worth protecting. Peptidoglycans grow my spinal column. They cross link a rigid reticulation dear to an absent heart. There are meshes everywhere. They make life interesting. My viability rests on transpeptidase. It works, the cross-linking with fake needles and instant jurisdiction. Penicillin is my nemesis, like reverse satin. It enters my habitat binding to transpeptidase. Such a bold beta lactam. It shocks me. I'm answerless. My mesh is inhibited. I wither on vines that burn. I'm thrashing around now, touching nothing. X reprobate. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, I love all the poems up to here, uh, but I'm I'm just I'm not giving 
uh, a lot of feedback because I just want to um, hear all of you. Uh, so I, I, I would like to, to continue with um, Miranda, if that's possible, and then if we have time, we can read another one. Thank you, Javi. Um, I, I, I thank you for all of your poems so far. Um, they've all been really lovely. I did just touch back on, on Angie's really quickly, and, and I, I just love that you were bringing together uh, sort of two perspectives that quite interest me as well. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I've researched is in my, my, my thesis was the intersection of poetry and science um, through the lens of human experience as a way of creating dialogue between science and the spiritual. Um, and I think that your poem does that quite nicely. And I think one of those important things about that is bringing together the, the inner and outer consciousness, the, the subjective and the objective. And that's one of the things that I think poetry has such a power to do quite well. Um, so I'll be, yeah. Um, yes. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, one of the things that I was going to read was from um, my uh, pamphlet, uh, Blue Dot of Art. Um, and it's it's a sort of a, a, a pamphlet that examines some of those things that, um, that Angie and I were just having a, a brief chat about there. Uh, this one is called Singularity Sum. And it's, um, taking themes from astronomy and cosmology, which is a lot of where my interests lie, um, and also um, theories of the brain. So I'll just read that one quickly here. Uh, singularity sum. One, look at this image of the brain under magnets, showing garnets striking lightning, amethysts falling from a distance, peridot meteors rising from mountains. It's a slingshot of our thoughts, bundled threads like veins of quartz, and it looks just like the universe. Two, we are so used to each other as bodies, rather than electrical fidgeting across a web of mysterious filaments, suspended on calcium carbonate above a blood hot sea. Three, broken down into components, nothing is singular. The sum of bruises is dark matter. The sum of blood is gravity. The sum, the sum's bones are the Higgs boson. The sum's skin luminesces stardust. The sum's womb gestates tornadoes. The sum's mouth envelops the sun and the sum's hair harbors auroras, and the sum's lungs exhale novas, and the sum whispers all the neutrinos streaming through our beings. Four. Observe, observe a map of Laniakea, unfurling like a dendrite, feathering gold threads over space-time. It's God's neuron limitless kaleidoscope, cosmic gossamer, strand of galaxies bifurcating, a supercluster of god thoughts, a repeating pattern pulsing within the soft shadows of matter, the sum that all of us live in. Yeah, <laughs> um, okay, uh, so uh, we can find these poems uh, on Consilience, right? Most of them. Uh, so go to that journal, uh, Consilience. Um, and uh, we have just uh, Steve doesn't read uh, his poem. And same with uh, Sam. So you are the two left. Uh, would you like a Steve to to share a poem? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so th this poem was written about um, some research into the uh, singing behavior of humpback whales. It's a fantastic project uh, led by uh, Dr. Alan Garland, at, who's uh, at the University of St. Andrews, but the project itself was conducted in the South Pacific Ocean um, between uh, the coast of Australia and the middle of the uh, middle of the South Pacific. Um, it is a 10 year project. So biological behavioral projects are often like this. They often take a really long time to acquire the data. And uh, in this case, the span of 
territory we're talking about is about a 10,000 kilometer range. So many sample points over that gathered over a period of 10 years to, to create the diagram, one small diagram. So, so science that embodies um, the information that's in this poem, but the information is incredibly lyrical. And basically is the discovery that male humpback whales create new songs, brand new songs every year. And these songs, not the whales, but the songs are copied by other whales and propagate across the ocean as if they were themselves a wave. So um, that's what this poem's about. It's called Sea Symphonies. Ellen's diagram is like a child's quilt. I turn her checkerboard about, swap out strident Microsoft primaries for shades that hurt me less. And in handling the squares, in redrafting with attention, I accommodate their stories. These colors migrate in meanings of movement, impressionism, baroque, punk, skiffle, shifting cribs styled from one mind there to another, even more far out, where they are, deep diving somewhere in exotic waters. The song square game is played with cryptic southern ocean rules. Some tunes draw a short season, just a few months drift afloat. Others caught and re-released are replayed in past Pacific, sounding out a cetacean wave, a year-long track of seaborne airtime. She's charting trends of alien voices. Just discovered whale-spun folk song sung to some purpose as yet unknown and sung untold in all this time. Thank you. Um, and uh, the last one, Sam, uh, would you like to share your poem? Of course, yeah, I'd just like to, I guess, say a few words very, very finally. I just wanted to say, you know, being Thank you so much for inviting us onto this podcast, Gabby. And you talked earlier about things we can do. And I think collaborating between projects like La Ninfa and like Consilience is a great way to do that. And all the people that I've collaborated with, I've learned so much from. Like most of the people in this chat I'm working with in some capacity. Stephen and I collaborated last year on putting together a collection of sonnets um, about uh, the... Oh, Miranda, that's an excellent workplace. <laughs> Thank you so much for the advertisement. And, you know, it was such a humbling experience to work with Stephen and to work together in that really collaborative way. And I learned so much about my practice and it was just amazing. Um, and, you know, Consilience really gives me that opportunity to learn from so many people. So I don't want to share one of my poems. I want to share a poem by somebody else. And this is a poem that was written by uh, Abigail Flint, who's an amazing poet and scientist and archaeologist. And this is from the first issue. And I think this touches, I just thought it was quite a nice poem. It touches on a lot of the things that we've talked about, like the spaces be between science and poetry and, and religion and spirituality that exist and th that need to be talked about and, and what fills these voids. So I, I offer it without any interpretation, um, but this is just a poem by Abigail Flint called In the Absence of Cures. In the absence of cures, we turn to charms, vials of cleansing elixir, veils to cover our mouths. We practice a collective magical geometry of distance, the ritual washing of hands. We speak spells and benedictions to one another across streets, across continents. We attend to daily numerologies, tallies and charts, awaiting equilibrium. We trust in art and law the extraordinary alchemy of medicine. Some petition their gods to allow us to endure these almost beings forged of fragments of our ancestors or something primal older than the gods themselves. At night, I dream of a contract, a bargaining of lives in a shared forgotten tongue. I place a Petri dish between grandmother stones crowned with a wreath of sage. And yeah, so round of applause for Abigail. I just read her words, which I think are beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, so we have 
about five minutes more. Uh, what I usually do uh, by the end is to give the opportunity to the people who participate to join us on this episode in particular uh, to share whatever they want. So if, if you want to share another short poem, uh, you can use time for doing that. If you would like to say a some final words, you are welcome. Um, if you don't want to say nothing, uh, to say uh, anything, that's fine as well. Um, so I will give you uh, this last five, six minutes uh, so you can uh, share your final thoughts. I was just going to say, if you happen to be in Leeds on the 20th of July, then I'm doing a workshop on uh, poetry and geology at the Leeds Poetry Festival. Oh, nice. Um, please um, feel uh, free to share the links uh, on uh, maybe on the on the live streaming uh, so people can access it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing. Sounds good. Time for me to do another piece. Yeah. Okay, hopefully not too long. This is called coding. It's trying to explain what it's like to be a programmer to people who are not. So it's a science into poetry. Lines expand under my fingers as night fills with sleepers' dreams. The soft percussion from the keyboard, the persistent chatter of the disc, while my typing forms machinery. Once on my knees before the broken dishwasher, I asked you to fetch my pliers. You brought me wire cutters, then wrench, then pincers, needing more than my vague gesture, snippety snip. Now I must think as if a computer that shuttles binary, not meaning. This is my dream of a machine, empty planning until a processor tries to execute what I claimed would work. Like real life, it's a series of bugs, minus the common sense that says, stop, I'll tell you the exact look of pliers. The impatience that says, fetch them yourself if you can't get the description right. I close down, sleep, passed as a parameter, forced to select, iterate, recurse into the endless corridor of mirror in the mirror, follow instructions that don't work into paths that never terminate. And the next day, done. Triangles flock like fish or birds on my screen, rippling with colours, while everyone says, how beautiful. A substanceless machine performs an answer to its imagined question. Yeah. <laughs> awesome program now. <laughs> Many, uh, many thanks. Um, thanks, Ruth. Um, anyone else would like to say something? Well, I just wanted to say to Ruth um, how much I love um, your poem, Ruth. I think it was amazing. And I especially yeah. like um, all the humorous elements um, that you placed in there. I think there needs to be you know, more humor in science communication. Um, I, yeah. I feel like humor really does bridge gaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was awesome, and and um, I'm. I would like to tell the audience, uh, please go to Consilience Journal and find all these awesome uh, writers and scientists, or scientists and writers, or the other way around, <laughs> and and read their poems, their bios, uh, what they be, uh, have been doing. Um, the, it's a fascinating world, um, and. Um, Mm, I don't know if uh, anyone else uh, was going to add something. Yep. Tiny, tiny poem that might follow on from that computing point. It's very small. It's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of about the Turing test. Yeah. It's very small, but maybe fed in quick. It's called Turing, <laughs> Turing True. Chatting to tech support, a glibly key, are you a bot? Remote assistance returns, that'd be quite something. Someday, will that question define an instance of clash, substratus, human, foolish, old? I hesitate some cycles. Query, not quite resolved. Has he just passed the test? Have I already failed? 
<laughs> yes, like it. Yeah, uh, Gisela is saying beautiful poems. Thank you all for sharing them with us. So thank you. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, anyone else? I, I, uh, today we are uh, um, many people, <laughs> more than usual. So I will ask uh, many times anyone else. So <laughs> uh, but I don't want to, you know, I want to, yeah, Miranda. I was just going to say thank you for having us because it's been a real pleasure to to have this conversation because I think we're all I mean I don't want to speak for everybody but I think we are all people who enjoy this intersection and, and the, the so many of the, the possibilities and the ideas and and just the creative fire that it brings and to have an opportunity to do that with with everybody today has just been a real pleasure so thank you Thank you. Yes, I, I feel honored uh, to be here today and have the opportunity to interview you and, and, and to, to create this uh, episode and to, to have been producing this episode because um, uh, it's, it's nice to do it and, and to, you know, to welcome all of you and, and to, to meet new people. And, um, and I don't know, I feel very happy Actually, also because uh, La Ninfa Eco UK is a new sort of like it's La Ninfa Eco, but it's a division, it's a new division that we created because of the language barrier. Uh, and um, uh, this is the first podcast that we are doing uh, entirely in English. Uh, and I'm very happy uh, to, 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 you know, to have this opportunity and to, and to start this new path <laughs> of episodes uh, in English. Uh, and we did, uh, we have done projects in English and we have articles and other things, but this is, and, and we have podcast partially in English, but this is the first one that, that is totally in English. So I'm, I'm quite happy with it. Um, so thank you for making it uh, possible to, to do it. Um, and as a final thing, I would like to add as well that tomorrow uh, we have another Facebook Live uh, in La Ninfa Eco, but the Spanish uh, La Ninfa Eco uh, with writers from Latin America and Europe. And we are going to have a book lunch um, um, from Malu, which is called uh, Punto de Encuentro. Is, uh, in English will be uh, Meeting Point, the name, something like that, Meeting Point. Um, and uh, it is going to be live from La Ninfa Eco at uh, 8 uh, p.m. from uh, Argent time from Argentina, Argentina time. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. And well, I think I will uh, finish <laughs> this episode uh, saying thank you. And um, it, it was a real pleasure. Thanks, thanks so much. Uh, and, and hope to see you again, maybe in the future. Thank, Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.